In today's video, we're going to continue our 2019 offseason plan report, and we're taking a look at the Edmonton Oilers, and that's coming up next. Welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. If you're new to the channel, thanks for stopping by. We review and discuss all 31 NHL teams, so if you're a huge hockey fan, consider subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. So welcome back to the 2019 offseason report series where we're covering all 31 teams with a dedicated video. This is video number 9 of 31. If you haven't caught the other ones, there'll be a playlist up here in the YouTube cards. You can check out the other eight teams already covered. And if the team you're looking for hasn't been covered yet, it will be covered here very soon in the next coming days and weeks as we get through all 31 teams. Now, in case you're new to the series as well, these videos are breaking down basically into three segments. Segment one, we're going to basically recap the 18-19 season and take a look at some key team and individual player statistics. We're also going to take a look at any significant changes that happened with this franchise throughout the course of the season, dating back to the last offseason. The second segment, we're going to take a look at all their contracts that are due this coming year. So all the RFAs, UFAs, and what cap space they have to deal with all that. And thirdly, we're going to look at what changes they should look at making to get better for next year and see if they can improve upon last year's performance. Now let's jump in here with the 18-19 season recap for the Edmonton Oilers. As most of you probably know, the Edmonton Oilers had a very disappointing 18-19 season, finishing with a record of 35, 38, 9, 79 points, seventh place in the Pacific Division of the playoffs here. Yet again, unfortunately, uh, the Oilers have just had no way to build upon a couple of years ago where they made the playoffs and went to round two, and it's been really all downhill ever since. Uh, they've regressed big time, and the team has many issues that need to be addressed this year. Of course, let's take a look at some key statistics for the team last year. Their power play was pretty solid, and I would hope it would be when you can put guys like McDavid and Dreisaitl out there. They had a 21.7% power play, ninth best in the NHL. The penalty killing, however, was less to be desired, 74.8% for 30th best. Only Chicago was worse in the PK, so that's certainly a major area of focus. Goals for was 232 goals, which again goes to show how little they have in the form of secondary scoring when you have guys like McDavid and Drysaddle sitting at the top of the league. And you can only be the 20th best scoring team. That's not a good result at all. And goals against wasn't much better. In fact, it was quite a bit worse, allowing 274 goals against for 25th best in the NHL. Now, of course, we saw many significant changes throughout the year. Uh, obviously, we saw the head coach, Todd McClellan, be fired. Uh, not long after that, we saw the GM, Peter Chiarelli, be fired. Of course, Keith Gretzky took over on an interim basis with Bob Nicholson kind of overseeing everything. Before Chiarelli was fired, he did make some trades to try to change things up, and we did see some other moves as well from Keith Gretzky after he took over on an interim basis. So let's take a quick look here at some of the deals that the Oilers made this year. First deal I want to have a look at, they traded forward Drake Kajula to the Chicago Blackhawks, essentially for Brandon Manning. There was other pieces involved, but they were the two main ones. Uh, Kajula goes to Chicago and did kind of have a pretty decent end of the year. I mean, he wasn't lighting it up, but he was doing all right. And Brandon Manning couldn't even get into the lineup and finish the year in the minors. So in my opinion, that was a horrible trade. Not totally against trading Kajula. I can understand maybe getting him a fresh start, seeing what you can get in return. But for Brandon Manning, really... <laughs> And he ended up in the minors. So that was a bad trade for sure. They had acquired Chris Weidman earlier in the year from the Ottawa Senators and then turned around and traded him as well to the Florida Panthers for Alex Petrovic. Petrovic's now pending UFA, and I'm going to guess that he likely doesn't return. So again, a deal that kind of looked okay at the time, but didn't really work out. They also picked up Sam Gagne along the way, which wasn't actually too bad. It was a small price tag to pay. Gagne goes back to Edmonton where he started his career and actually didn't do too badly for the games he was able to play in. They also traded goalie Cam Talbot, who was desperate for a fresh start as a pending UFA. They knew they weren't going to be re-signing him. They made him aware of that as they played Koskinen more throughout the year. Um, obviously, it was a quite clear that Talbot's time in Edmonton was coming to an end. They traded him to the Philadelphia Flyers in exchange for younger goaltender Anthony Stolarz. Stolarz obviously became available after Carter Hart emerged to take over the starting role there. Uh, Stolarz has battled some pretty significant injuries the last couple of years and hasn't really played a whole lot, which in result is going to make him a pending free agent here as well, which we'll get into in the next segment. But ultimately, they made some trades throughout the year. However, the team didn't really improve a whole heck of a lot from it. And some of these deals, like I said, didn't really make the greatest sense, especially the ones that Shirelli had made earlier 
in the season. Now let's take a look at some of their top individual stats, including goaltending and their top scorers. Goaltender Miko Koskinen played the bulk of the games this year, and of course before Shirelli was fired, he gave Koskinen a nice extension, which I completely do not understand. Uh, he really gave him a, a pretty high-paying contract for a goalie who's not established, in my opinion. He did finish with a 25-21-6 and record, and 293 goals against average, and a 906 save percentage. So not fantastic, but again, most goalies would struggle with the team in front of them being on the ice there with the Oilers. I don't blame him completely, but at the same time, I don't think he's ready to be a full-time starting goaltender. Hopefully this year, the Oilers can address that here as well, which we'll get into in the final segment. The top scorers, of course, led by Connor McDavid, 116 points. Another solid year from him. Leon Dreisaitl scored 50 goals and 105 points. So those two guys continue to light it up. After McDavid and Dreisaitl, though, it is a fairly steep drop off. But Ryan Nugent Hopkins is definitely their third best forward with 69 points. I think uh, Nugent Hopkins is pretty solid, though, overall. But really, after those three, it really falls off. Next, we go down to Darnell Nurse, their top scoring defenseman with 41 points. And Alex Chason emerged as uh, having a career year with 22 goals. So obviously the secondary scoring was not significant enough to propel this team to have more success and to have a shot at the playoffs. Let's jump over to segment two where we take a look at their contracts that need to be done this year. So UFAs, RFAs, and what cap space they have to accomplish all this. Now in the terms of RFAs, they do have a fair bit here and we're going to start with Toby Reeder. I'd be completely shocked if he's qualified in return. Uh, we had heard comments from Bob Nicholson earlier in the year basically blaming everything on Toby Reeder, saying if he actually would have scored some goals, they would have made the playoffs, which was really uh, not a wise thing to say completely untrue yes reader did not work out but certainly not all poor toby's fault by any means uh ty ratty's a pending ufa as well and even though he's looked good the last couple years in the preseason has failed to deliver in the regular season on a consistent basis at all so again debatable if he's back hard to say uh juder Kara certainly an rfa i would surprise I would think they likely retain him uh, for a bottom six role. And of course, uh, Jesse Pugliarvi, their top pick here from a few years ago, who struggled to find a regular spot in their lineup, is an RFA. I would imagine he'll definitely be qualified and retained. Uh, his, his future, though, with the Oilers is certainly debatable at best. Now, taking a look at the UFAs, we have Alex Chason, who emerged, like I said, as a, having a career year with 22 goals. I would hope they wouldn't overpay to keep him as much as they need secondary scoring, and he provided that at a pretty decent level. I'm, I'm certainly open to the Oilers keeping him. I just hope they don't go and overpay for too much and too long. Chason deserves another chance with the Oilers, and I'd certainly be open to them signing him. I just hope they don't go too crazy on the term and money because it's really one solid year. His other years, he's really bounced around a lot between the Capitals, the Flames, and the Senators, and the Stars before that. Um, so he hadn't really been all that consistent. So I would hope that they wouldn't go too much and too long. Uh, defenseman Alex Petrovic is a UFA, along with defenseman Kevin Gravel. And as I mentioned, the uh, the goal that he acquired from the Flyers, Anthony Stolarz, due to his lack of games played and how long he's been in the league, he is a Group 6 UFA this year. Um, so he will need to be re-signed and could possibly leave, but I would imagine he'll remain with the Oilers for a, a decent opportunity. If you take a look at their cap space here, uh, for next year, they have 15 players under contract for the 1920 season and total of $71 million worth of contracts. So that gives them about 11 to 12 million to play with. But when you look at the number of players that need to either sign or replace, that's not a whole heck of a lot of money. And obviously Ken Holland's going to have his job cut out for him here to find some cap space. And uh, there's going to be some ways he can look at doing that, which we'll get into here in the next segment. So in the third segment here, what do the Oilers need to do to get better for next year? And I had a hard time compiling this list. Where do you start with the Edmonton Oilers? There is so many problems. This organization has been mismanaged for so long that they have such great players like Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl, yet they fail to be good at any other areas of the game. They have so many other players that just are not getting it done. Uh, they need help in net. They need help on the blue line. They need secondary scoring up front. So exactly where do you start? Well, if I'm Ken Holland, step one, you need to hire yourself a head coach. Obviously, that has to be fairly important on his to-do list here, and it's rumored that he is leaning towards Dave Tippett. Of course, Dave Tippett's got a lot of success in the NHL, and I do think Tippett would be a pretty solid coach for the Oilers. Now, he is known as a defense-first type of coach, uh, but I've heard many NHL guys who've had him as a coach have a lot of great things to say, and I think that he would be a terrific fit for them. Uh, so certainly that we'll see if that's uh, the route they go. But either way, Ken Holland needs to determine a head coach and a style of play uh, for this team, start getting some systems into place, and then obviously that'll help them decide what kind of personnel they need to really move this team along here. But obviously that's a, a big step for Ken Holland, which hopefully won't take too long to have accomplished. 
Secondly, they need to cut some dead weight off their roster here, including guys like Milan Lucic and possibly even defenseman Andre Sekera. I know Sekera, is, you know, for the most part, is a pretty good defenseman, but he's had so many injuries, you can't rely on him anymore. He doesn't have a long term left on his contract. Unfortunately, Lucic does. He's got four years, so I'd really push hard to trade those guys. It's not going to be an easy task at all. You'd have to sweeten the deal either by adding a pick, a prospect, retaining salary. Do what you can do. You got to do something to get them off your books and free up some space here so you can go a different route uh there is a possibility we could look at doing some buyouts as well uh, i know the loot cheat buyout would be a little bit longer term but you got to do something here to create some a roster space and create some cap space and uh, i to me if i'm the gm i'm trying to move these guys away in one shape or form or another so we'll see how they go about it but obviously that would be top of my priority list here as well now, obviously, they've been talking a lot in the Oilers organization about letting their prospects properly develop, and Ken Holland, I don't think, will stray from that at all. We've seen the Detroit Red Wings over the longest time be very patient with their prospects. It was rare that you even seen a first-round pick go straight to the NHL. They almost always, always took one to two years in the American Hockey League and really developed. And of course, the Detroit Red Wings for the longest time as well were you know, a playoff team. They had a 25-year streak. In the playoffs, so the Red Wings quite often weren't picking overly high anyway. So obviously the talent they were picking, uh, even though they were good players and many of them worked out for the Red Wings, certainly were not your you know your top two or three, four picks or whatever, who quite often are the ones that go straight to the NHL anyhow. But we saw that not too long ago with Dylan Larkin. But outside of Larkin, there's not too many guys that the Red Wings have let go rate to the NHL. So I think he's going to be good for helping their prospects develop. So we're talking about guys like Paul Yarvey, Yamamoto, you know, Evan Bouchard. Uh, you know, some of these guys appear that they're not quite ready yet. Uh, reports that I've been seeing and they need time to properly develop before they end up stunting their development here and ruining their possibility of being an NHL player. Obviously, when it comes to the 2019 NHL draft, they hold the number eight overall selection, so they need to make sure they use that pick very wisely. We've seen some uh, times in the past where the Oilers have gotten a solid player in the first round. We've also seen some times where they've had and not used very wisely, like the former number one overall selection, Neil Yakupov. Now, of course, I understand that most teams in that position likely would have taken him and, you know, likely wouldn't have turned out any better for them. But at the same time, you know, the Oilers have had a lot of high picks over the years and they haven't all panned out. So they need to make sure they pick the right player for their team. And that selection, you're probably looking at a guy maybe like a Trevor Zegras, maybe a Kirby Doc, uh, possibly Dylan Cousins falls to that point. Hard to say. Uh, they could look to some uh, pretty solid defensemen uh, like a Soderstrom or a Broberg or any of those guys. There's going to be lots of good players to pick from. They need to make sure they decide and use that pick very wisely for the future here because that player could turn out to be in a couple of years time a pretty solid player helping this roster take some big steps forward now they also need some secondary scoring they need a goaltender they need some defensemen like i said depending on how all the other things i mentioned here work out for them for clearing cap space making trades they can try to address these needs but again it's not going to be no easy task they don't have a ton of space that ken holland can go shopping for free agents so he's going to have to find contracts that are certainly team friendly but can get the job done they need a goaltender who can be like a 1a 1b with koskinen they could probably use a little bit of extra help on the blue line now they do have a lot of good young defensemen in the system they could try to lean on those guys a little bit more hopefully they can pan out here especially with a nice defensive minded coach and the right coaching staff that might be the way to go there they might be able to put more of their efforts in goaltending and finding some secondary scoring uh for the forward group certainly would be a big help connor and leon can't do it all themselves uh, they look at how look at how much they produced the last couple of years and where they rank amongst the NHL uh, teams for goals scored and uh, obviously wins and points and whatnot. It's just not getting it done. They need some help up there and they need to get it quick before their top stars get too frustrated and decide that they don't want to be a part of this organization anymore. Because in a couple of years' time, I can certainly see the frustrating setting in enough that it's a risk they're running if things don't get turned around. So if you're the GM of the Edmonton Oilers, you're Ken Holland. I know this is not going to be an easy task, but what moves would you try to make this summer to take this team in the right direction? It's not all going to be done in a day. It's likely not all going to be done in one season even. But where would you start? What things do you think are most paramount they get done this year to help this team move forward for next year? If you're new to the channel, I hope you consider subscribing. We cover all 31 NHL teams, and there's plenty of content here for all hockey fans to enjoy. So if you're new, subscribe for more videos in this series. There's plenty more coming. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it as well. I'd appreciate it if you did. As always, thank you for watching, and I will catch you next time.